Ladies and gentlemen, today I have a great feat in mind. And I don't think I'm going to pull it off, but I'm going to try to pull it off. I would like to tackle this age-old question. Did Kurt Cobain start dancing with Mr. Brownstone intravenously before he met Courtney Love or after he met Courtney Love? We're going to use Come As You Are. We are going to use thanks to a patron, Cindy Marksberry. We're going to use Dave Grohl's book. Thanks for sending that to me. It's coming in very useful in the upcoming videos. And we're going to use an old interview with Kurt and Chris. And then we're going to use an interview with Courtney Love that Michael Azarad did for the book Come As You Are and uh, speculate a little bit. In case you are unaware, people within that underground scene always speculated that Kurt never got that off on Mr. Brownstone until he got with Courtney Love. Now, Kurt knew that this was destroying his wife's image. She's got him hooked on these drugs. She's controlling him. She's introduced him to all these shady characters that have torn him apart from his real friends, Buzz Osborne, Dale Crover, Chris Novoselic, Chad Channing, Dave Grohl. And she's just introduced him to these people that he cannot get away from because now he's addicted, right? Kurt says in Come As You Are that he did try opiates long before he met Courtney Love. That I have no doubt of. Basically, the period of time leading up to Nevermind, Dave says he witnessed Kurt Cobain take three what he thought was probably Percocet and chug them down with a beer. Anyone who has ever found themselves in the grips of hardcore addiction knows there is a big, big difference between taking a Percocet and using heroin intravenously, night and day. Although they both contain opiate, one is much more likely to dig its claws into you than the other. I mean, how many people have had a wisdom tooth cut out and then got a prescription of Percocet? used the Percocet for the pain, and then moved on with their life. Compared to how many people have had heroin shot in their vein, and then just moved on with their life. So the argument isn't, did Kurt try opiates? The argument is, was he using Mr. Brownstone intravenously before he met Courtney Love? Even a doctor will tell you, huge difference, huge difference. So the first thing I would like to show to you is an old interview with Nirvana where Chris talks about the recording of Bleach. It was done like in like four days or I don't even forget how many days, under a week, three, four, five days, something like that, 600 bucks. Um, I, you know what, we were all, when we were mixing it, we were really sick and Kurt went down to the health department and he got these uh, codeine cough syrups and we were just popping those and we were just like in la la land and then we were like hands-on producers just cooking on this codeine joy juice i think it had a big effect on how that record turned out that's the honest truth we were tripping on codeine joy juice so back then you could just go to your local health department the county health department and say you had a cold or whatever and they would give you codeine codeine is a hell of a lot different than heroin. So at the very most, during the recording of Bleach, all Nirvana was doing was sipping on some scissor. Now let's back this up. Let's back what Chris says up with what he told Mr. Azarad in Come As You Are. I like it when I see the same story in two different sources. If the mixes on Bleach sound a little strange, there may be a very good reason. We were all sick by then, Chris remembers, and we had this codeine syrup from the Pierce County Health Department. So we were drinking a lot of that for our sickness, but we were really on codeine and we were mixing the record and getting really into it. So if Kurt Cobain was a addict by then, codeine cough syrup would do nothing for him. It would be like taking a Tylenol, apples and oranges. What this reminds me of is kids. I remember when I was in high school, we would do this thing called roboing, where you drink like a whole bottle of Robitussin. I don't even really know if it actually messes you up. I think we just did it because we were stupid kids. Yes, they were drinking codeine cop syrup. This is not something that would satisfy someone who is addicted to something as strong as heroin. So we know that during the bleach era, Kurt was not using heroin. 
And quite honestly, if you've ever seen anybody who's strung out, you can just look at him in that interview and tell that he's not strung out. We move into the year Dave Grohl is now in the band. He starts in 1990, by the very next year, 1991, they're world famous. Again, Dave lived with Kurt in Olympia during that year period. And this is what he says about Kurt's habits. One night in Olympia, while I was out drinking with friends, someone had pills, some sort of prescription painkiller. Take one with a few beers and you'll be super buzzed, I was told. Even that made me nervous, so I stuck to just cocktails, but I watched Kurt take two or three with his drink. It scared me. I was always pretty timid when it came to taking anything for fear of the consequences of taking too much, but I knew friends back in Virginia who would always push the boundaries a little to see how far they could take it. I began to learn that Kurt was also this way in every way. Again, this is a prescription painkiller. This is not street drugs. I gotta tell you, I've had friends who've went down that road, some of them very talented musicians who probably could have made it in the musician world. They could have at least afforded to pay their bills by being musicians. They went down a uh, heroin highway, and I'm telling you, a couple prescription pills would do nothing for them once they started down that road. It's just not potent enough. What I'm getting from this is even during the year after Dave Grohl has joined the band, Kurt is still not using heroin. Now let's move on to Come As You Are after Courtney Love has entered Kurt Cobain's life. This is around Thanksgiving, November 1991. According to Danny Goldberg and numerous other media sources, this is only one month after their official romance begins. Kurt and Courtney had done heroin together in Amsterdam for two days around Thanksgiving of 1991. This is a quote from Kurt Cobain, thinking I'm saving face for my girlfriend. It was my idea, says Kurt. I was the one that instigated it, but I didn't really know how to get it. So Courtney was the one who would be able to somehow get it. She would be the one who would take me to the place where we might have a chance of being able to find it. We only did it twice on the whole tour. They found a guy on the street who took them to the city's infamous red light district where they scored. Later, they did some more in London. Kurt Cobain, the shy, quiet guy from Aberdeen, Washington, doesn't even know how to get it. Courtney, however, is very comfortable and very familiar with any city's underbelly. Anywhere in the world she goes, she fits in. She blends into that environment because that's the environment she likes. And she takes Kurt to this area where they score. Probably the first time he had ever been to a shady area in a city in his life. When Buzz Osborne first took Kurt Cobain to Seattle to see shows, Kurt would lock himself in the car until he walked into the venue and then immediately come out of the venue, get in the car and lock the doors. That's how scared he was of being mugged or robbed or just being in a big city. It intimidated him. Now let's move back a year to November of 1990. So Thanksgiving, the previous Thanksgiving. This is a part of Come As You Are that I believe is made up. I believe Kurt had Dave and Chris go along with this because his wife, at the time this book came out, his wife was getting so much crap for having led him down the wrong path that Kurt wanted to save face for her and I believe this part is made up, and I'll tell you why after I read it. Dave was down in Los Angeles sitting in with L7 at a Rock for Choice benefit. He called Chris to ask him to wire some money, and they were just about to hang up when Chris suddenly said, wait a minute, I gotta tell you something. Kurt's been doing heroin. What, said Dave shocked? How did you find out? He told me, Chris said. Don't tell him that I told you. When Dave came back home, Kurt mentioned he'd done heroin and Dave tried to stay cool about it and just ask what it was like. It sucked. It's stupid, Kurt replied. It makes you feel gross and bad. I just wanted to try it. Kurt said he wouldn't do it again and I believed him. Dave is living with Kurt at this time. If someone is using drugs intravenously, trust me, you know it. Now, is it possible that he just did it like once he dabbled in it? Probably. Sure, like somebody came along and was like, hey, I got this shit, you want to try it? And he just tried it. On a regular basis? No. No, Dave would have known. In Dave's book, he says as much. He doesn't actually mention that conversation at all. And he says, I felt duped when I finally figured out that Courtney and Kurt were doing heroin. I felt stupid because the whole time we lived together, 
didn't seem like he was doing heroin to me. I never, I couldn't believe that he could have done it. You know, basically what he's saying is Kurt's telling the press that he was doing heroin while we were living together to make it seem as though he had this habit before meeting Courtney. How could I have not noticed? I feel stupid. Obviously, Kurt was not addicted. He was not doing it on a regular basis. He may have only even done it once during the whole year they lived together. Dave himself says he didn't notice anything. He didn't really take note until Kurt got with Courtney. Okay, keep following me. Let's listen to what Tracy Miranda has to say about the time she was with Kurt Cobain. At the time, says Tracy, I didn't know it was going to go as far as it did. I don't think he did it when we were going out, as far as I know. Kurt told Tracy that heroin made him really social. He felt like he could go out and have a good time and talk to people and not feel uncomfortable. The funny thing is, when he was getting all these tests for his stomach, he actually came home one time from the hospital and he said, they tried to give me another blood test and they already gave me four tests. He walked out of there because he said he would almost faint when they tried to draw blood because he couldn't stand the needle in his arm. Okay. This is Tracy Miranda reacting to statements that Kurt Cobain had made to the media in the early 90s saying, oh, I was doing heroin long before I met Courtney. It's not Courtney's fault. I was doing this shit when I was with Tracy Miranda. And Tracy Miranda saying, I didn't notice him doing heroin. He didn't act like he was on heroin when we were together. Same thing Dave says in his book, The Year Leading Up to Meeting Courtney Love. I wonder if it's possible that when Tracy says, well, Kurt told me that heroin made him social, if she's actually referring to opiates, painkillers, prescription pills. More than once, Kurt made the statement that in Aberdeen, in Olympia, in Washington in general, he didn't even know where to find it if he wanted it. He even made a statement that he consciously decided not to do heroin because he knew if he got addicted, there was no supply. It was never even around enough to be an addict in his circles. He didn't know the right people. So was Tracy either misquoted or when she said heroin, was she actually referring to, you know, Percocet or Vicodin or something like that. The question is, is Kurt making up a false narrative to help restore the image of his wife? The two people who lived with Kurt prior to Courtney Love living with Kurt, and I think I would even throw Toby Vale in there, they say they never saw it happening. And quite simply, if you just watch his interviews before he met Courtney to afterward, you see a big change in his behavior. We're not done yet. Let's dig a little deeper and read from Come As You Are. Around December of 1990, Courtney and Dave became friendly through Dave's former girlfriend, Jennifer Finch. Remember, he sat in for the Rock for Choice benefit for L7. She was fun to talk to because if you were bored, you could spend three hours on the phone. Dave says of Courtney, it was funny because I'd never talked to anyone who was so entertainment business wise or LA wise as Courtney. It was kind of neat to have a conversation with someone who you could picture being behind a desk at USA Magazine or something. Ooh, so check this out. Courtney Love and Dave Grohl were friends before Courtney ever had a relationship with Kurt Cobain. After Courtney revealed to Dave that she had had a crush on Kurt, Dave told Courtney that Kurt liked her too. Now he may have just been doing this just to be nice because Courtney was his friend at the time, but she didn't quite believe it. Still, she gave Dave a package to give to Kurt, little seashells and pine cones and miniature teacups and a tiny doll, all packed into a small heart-shaped box. Courtney swears that if she had not forgot that Kurt never replied, she wouldn't have bothered chasing him anymore. So December 1990, she's friends with Dave Grohl. She has a crush on Kurt Cobain. Through Dave Grohl, she sends Kurt this heart-shaped box. What does this tell you? She doesn't know Kurt directly. If she knew Kurt directly, she would hand it directly to Kurt. She became friends with Dave to get to Kurt, and Kurt ignored her. He ignored her all the way up until October of 91 in Chicago at the Metro. So all this, we were friends before we started dating. We had known each other since 88, since 89. No, people knew Kurt, but Kurt didn't know them. 
even then he was gaining recognition as this, you know, his, his voice was very unique. And even though Bleach didn't top the charts and melt everyone's faces, everyone recognized that Kurt had a very special voice, just like Chris Cornell, just like Lane Staley. People knew he was going to be something. So, of course, Courtney could know him, but he didn't know her. Although many would soon come to believe, and still do, that Courtney was a gold digger, she insists she didn't think Kurt would ever be anything more than a revered cult figure when she began chasing him. Again, she's chasing him. Singers of bands have many girls all over the world chasing them. That doesn't mean that they're in a relationship or they're friends, it just means she's after him. I thought I was going to be more famous than him, says Courtney. That was pretty obvious to me. The way she looks at it now, marrying Kurt Cobain was a bad career move. There is no doubt that Courtney likes attention, but much of her grandstanding can be seen as an effort to assert herself to avoid getting outshone by Kurt's brilliant star. Courtney Love could not stand it that Kurt was becoming more famous than her once they did get together. Here's the part that I really, really want to get to. During the period of time that Nirvana has their contract, they've been given an advance by David Geffen, and they're going to record in Van Nuys, California, what would become the most amazing rock album ever, never mind. Courtney just happened to move a block away from where Kurt and Dave and Chris were staying at the Oakwood Apartments. Interesting fact, and I was going to include this in a rare Nirvana facts video, but I'll tell you right now. The, I don't know their names, but the guys from the old movie's house party, Kid and Play, you remember those two dudes? They were staying in the apartment right across the hall from Dave and Chris and Kurt. So what happens is when these studios invest in entertainers, whether they're musicians, actors, actresses, when they're first starting out, they'll, they have apartment buildings that they'll just shove them all in. Matter of fact, the same apartment building, the Oakwood Apartments, is where kids with their moms would stay for the old uh, TV show Star Search. So this building was packed with entertainers, people coming up in the industry who are hoping to make it big. Courtney moves one block away from an apartment where talented people live for a temporary period of time. The Oakwood Apartments is where record companies, TV shows, executives, producers, movie producers, this is where they would temporarily house their new talent who's doing work in California. Do you think it's just a coincidence that Courtney decided to move one block away from naive people coming up in the industry? She is literally catching people as they're coming up in the ent entertainment industry. You understand? Like Courtney always said, she was going to find a way to become famous. She always positioned herself where if I can't be famous because I have no talent, I'll make somebody love me who does have talent. This is a calculative woman. I am going to position myself in proximity of talented people from all over the world who are being placed in this apartment complex to do great things, and I'm going to make friends with them. Kid and Play from House Party had been living there while they shot the movie House Party. And Dave says she starts coming around looking for Kurt. Courtney happened to live only a block away from the Oakwood Apartments, and she stopped by a few times. Chris didn't pay her much mind. She was some loud girl, he says. I'd never heard of her before. Chris Novoselic and Kurt Cobain grew up together. They've been in a band together for years. They're now living together with Dave. At this point in time, they're inseparable. He says, I've never heard of Courtney Love. If she was involved in Kurt Cobain's life, don't you think Chris Novoselic would say, oh yeah, Courtney's been friends with Kurt since like 88, 89, but I know her. He says, I've never heard of her before. This is Courtney's words about Kurt once she finally gets Kurt to hang out with her. We bonded over pharmaceuticals. I had Vicodin Extra Strength, which was pills, and he had cough syrup. I said to Kurt, you're a pussy. You shouldn't drink that cough syrup. It's bad for your stomach. She calls him a pussy for drinking codeine. Once somebody has crossed that line and they've went over to the really, really hardcore strong stuff, that weak cough syrup crap it does nothing for you. It's no fun anymore. You gotta have the strong stuff. 
This, to me, is proof that Kurt had not crossed that line. And Courtney's actually making fun of him, saying, oh, don't do the weak stuff. Try the hard stuff. Now, she says, I had Vicodin extra strength. But I guarantee that it was more than Vicodin extra strength. If you watched my very last video, you would know that Courtney began doing the hardcore stuff at the age of 18 with Jennifer Finch. This is Courtney downplaying her role of getting Kurt into the hard stuff. She's like, ooh, I was messing with Vicodin extra strength, knowing that anybody would be like, well, shit, that ain't nothing. My grandma gets Vicodin. You know, come to think of it, Kurt Cobain and Courtney's situation is a lot like Jimi Hendrix and a girlfriend he had. Jimi always kept this one girlfriend around. Um, similar situation. She stripped. Uh, she was a prostitute as a teenager very street smart wherever this woman went she knew how to score she knew where to go and who to talk to to score so jimmy actually kept her as a girlfriend and took her around the world with him i believe kurt cobain got in the same situation with courtney where he had to drag her along to feed this addiction and you say well how would she know people all around the world well you don't need to know people you just need to know where to go if you are street smart you go to where the prostitutes are wherever the prostitutes are is where the drugs are going to be that's not speculation that's not my input Courtney told, I believe, the British TV show host, uh, Jonathan Ross, that that's what she would do. When she'd go to a new city, she would call up an escort service or go to a red light district, wherever the prostitutes were, and she would hire them. And then she would say, well, I don't want sex from you. I want you to get drugs for me. You know, this is something Courtney has admitted. I also believe that Courtney may have had a hand in bringing American girls, both white and black American girls, to Japan who ended up in very bad situations they could not escape. I'm researching and that's for another video. I need to collect more evidence before I start running my mouth about that. But you can look forward to that in the future. Let's see what else Courtney has to say about this. Kurt called her up at five in the morning on the pretense of asking if she had any drugs. Courtney said no and made a date with Kurt for the next day. He stood her up and then kept his phone off the hook so she couldn't call. I couldn't decide if I actually wanted to consummate our relationship, he explains, smiling. She seemed like poison because I'd just gotten out of the last relationship that I didn't even want to be in. At the time, Courtney claims their relationship finally blossomed. Chris Novoselic is saying, I've never heard of this bitch before. Don't know who the fuck she is. And Kurt is being made fun of by Courtney because he's still on the cop syrup. Again, let's remind ourselves, would cop syrup do anything for a heroin addict? No, it would be like taking a Tylenol. Was, was Kurt interested? Could he be pushed in that direction? Absolutely. That's why he called Courtney. Now she says he called me up under the pretense of trying to get me to get him drugs but I made a date for the next day. That's her opinion. I believe Kurt actually just called her to see if she could get him some drugs. At this point in time, he doesn't even know where to get heroin if he wanted to do it. Pretty obvious that his heroin addiction did not start until Courtney Love began getting it for him and showing him where to get it. I hope we can all agree on this. It's there in black and white. You just have to be looking. Whether you're a Courtney Love fan or not, it seems pretty obvious that uh, this guy didn't even know where to get it, let alone already have a habit of it. Bye bye